Well, let's now uh, include the other two uh, members we have online and push our limits of technology today and have a group conversation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, interesting. So, uh, uh, Dorothy, what are you using for data? Did you get, uh, did you, were you allocated data for, to the, um, uh, from the Democratic Party? Yeah, so we uh, we got our vote builder access before we were endorsed by Justice Democrats and brand new Congress. Um, and but they are denying us um, the caucus data from 2016. They say we have to pay $26,000 for it because that's what it costs the state to operate the caucuses. I mean, that's not really how data works, but um, it just it's it's a strange thing and we can't get a straight answer on it. Um, my campaign manager is actually a state committee woman. And so she's been asking on the state com the, the statewide calls that they do on a regular basis for an answer as to why we should have to pay this kind of money for the data and why it's not just included in the vote builder that they're giving candidates. Because I would think if they want to win races, like they would give us the, <laughs> the most recent voter data that we have and the I mean the people who show up to caucus are like they're energized they want to be involved they want to be engaged they're going to be our biggest base and we're not going to defeat the Republican incumbent without a strong grassroots campaign without getting these people involved because we're never going to out fundraise her she's going to have super PAC money like she's going to have Koch brother money and I mean, we have we have a paper mill. We have a Georgia Pacific paper mill here. So the Koch brothers actually have a vested interest in this district. And so I, I just can't, I cannot fathom why they would not just want to give us that data. And I'm willing to pay a little bit extra for it, but I'm not paying 26,000 when they can divide that money by all of the candidates running. That's the whole point, right? To, uh, because, the, because grassroots campaigns don't have that much money. The point is to... Um, limit your campaign, extract as much as they can from you so you cannot run an effective campaign. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that they could, um, you know, even they could put a price tag of $26,000 on it, but they could also make half of that or two thirds of that or three fourths of that an in kind contribution so that you, your, your final bill is something a little bit more reasonable. Well, they've already in kind of vote builder test. We actually only had to pay $100 for it. Wow. We maxed out our in kind. I'd actually like to ask you a quick question, Dorothy. Did you have to be endorsed by 50% plus one of your legislative districts to gain access? Nope. Huh. Uh, we just told them the truth because none of our, like, like, all of our counties, they won't endorse in a contested primary. It's in our bylaws because we need to, you know, let the primary play out. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the one thing I also want to mention, too, about what's going on with me is conveniently this bylaw is being applied to my race. Um, Adam Smith also just happens to be one of their top fundraisers from big companies and especially the war industry. He's a war hawk. So he brings in a ton of money because the business of death is booming. Yep. And he's also gotten 100000 dollars from telecom. And surprise, surprise, lukewarm response on net neutrality. <laughs> That's my <laughs> that is exactly, actually. <laughs> and it's so hard to point out uh, because I when I was canvassing for Sarah, uh, I came across a lot of people who were like, "Oh, why are you uh, primarying Adam? He's like he's a, a Democrat we trust." And then when I talk about his voting record, he's like he's great with uh, with refugees. As like he helps create them, if that's what you mean. <laughs> um, he's uh, never seen a cluster bomb. He didn't love. Voted to give it to um, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and one of the uh, big countries that has uh, egregious human rights violations. On top of that, he's um, uh, he voted for the $700 billion Trump uh, budget increase. And we asked him that question in a round table, and he basically just dismissed it as, uh, as if we didn't understand anything. He's like, oh, that's just appropriation. That does not mean that that bill is passed. Like, he was just, he is, he is disingenuous, and it's hard to convince the people of his voting record, but I, I, I am sure the times are changing and people are paying more attention and they'll dig in yeah. and see what he has done, I hope. Well, that's why they have a vested interest in protecting this seat. So it's been kind of fun, but really frustrating. <laughs> and it's interesting, it's not protecting it from a Republican, it's protecting it from another Democrat. Yeah, and people were, I got, someone asked me, like, aren't you afraid of splitting the vote? I'm like, between who? 
two <laughs> Democrats. And that just blows my mind. Either way, a Democrat will hold this district. So I don't understand what vote we're splitting. <laughs> So uh, if, if you're elected, you're going to be two among 435 people in the House of Representatives. And um, and unless the Democrats completely blow it again, <laughs> they should eke out a majority next year. Um, so if you were ended up in the majority, uh, how do you how do you envision yourself making progress? So making progress, one of the good things about running as a Justice Democrat with other candidates like Dorothy is we have a huge slate of candidates that are running together. And, you know, God willing or higher powers willing, if we wind up having enough Justice Democrats in those seats, that's easy. We all agree on the same platform. One of the things that we have to do is we have to have Democrats who are willing to, to have a spine and to stand up for this and to fight. Go knock on your colleague's office. I will physically bring myself to my colleague's offices and I will sit down with them if they're on the fence about Medicare for all. I will hammer it out with them. You just have to have representatives that are willing to, to throw legislation on the table that's powerful and real and actually affects people and then make an actual point to talk to the constituents of the representatives that are reluctant or wishy-washy or won't sign on. You have to actually be willing to step outside your comfort zone. One of the things with being a, the, the, one of the duties of a federal level Congress is you're not just repping your district, you're actually there to fight for the entire nation. So it's, it's kind of an interesting dynamic, but you also have to remember that my duty is to the ninth district, but it's also to all the other Americans surrounding the ninth district. So going out and being present and being a voice, Pramila Jaipal does this really well. She's always out educating. She's always out sharing information. She's always in interviews, explaining things to people. She's extremely transparent. We need more representatives like that in office. who are gonna actually help constituents be educated enough to pressure their democratic representatives to step up and actually take a risk and to defy their donors and fight for net neutrality. Um, we need to be loud. We need to be obstinate. We need to stop giving up and we need to refuse to compromise on the things that matter. And that's exactly what I plan to do in Congress. I'm a very fiery person and I'm excited to bring that to me to, to a place that actually needs representatives like that. <sighs> Dorothy. <laughs> uh, well, um, a lot of what she said, <laughs> but um, I mean, the big thing we have to do is we have to take on the lobbying industry. We have to make it illegal for them to donate and influence our politicians directly. Um, and that until we do that, we're never going to make any headway. And because they're going to constantly be able to go in and kill the bills that benefit us by simply influencing just the subcommittees, which is only like 15 people. And so it's easy for them to come in and do a little bundling, their little campaign finance, you know, campaign donation magic to get them to just to kill the bills that benefit the, the common man. So we're not like right now we are in a place where we are paying taxes without representation. And so we need to take that on and we need to go in there and be fighters for the people. And that's the beauty, right, of Justice Democrats and brand new Congress. So right now with brand new Congress, we've got two Republicans running who are committed to taking on campaign finance. And then we've got hopefully soon the justice democrats i think are aiming for about 50 candidates you know so even if we just get some of those wins um we'll be able to to start influencing you know our party in general and saying like this this is how you win because campaign finance is a nonpartisan issue it is something that like 90 percent or more of the public at this point knows that that how we are financing campaigns is the reason why we have no influence over our government. And that's, that is the single greatest threat to our democracy is that right now we do not have one person, one vote. The decisions, everything that is done is done for the wealthy. And that's why we have massive income inequality and endless war and all of these really stupid decisions that are made based on greed and not based on what is good for humanity. So you know, it's been interesting watching the race in Alabama because as much as people talk about uh, what happened there, the reality is only 30% of the population voted, which means that we don't know how 70% of the people would have voted. We don't know if their, 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 
they're progressive people, they're fair-minded people who just gave up, or if they're all agents of Satan and Satan was having a convention that day. Um, but only 30% voted. And one of the tactics that is being used is that, uh, that you know, just like in the, the, the Clark County meetings, they make the meeting so unpleasant, no sane person would ever want to spend their precious few moments of private life doing that. And yet, what's been so encouraging about what's happened over the past year and a half is that, that uh, the younger generation has taken this on as a challenge uh, and has not given up. And they're stuck in and, and every time they get pushed back like that, it just makes them stronger. So I was wondering if you had any suggestions on on how you talk to people to keep them engaged in the fight, to take back our democracy. You got to give people something to re-engage them. One of the greatest things we can do, and it's bizarre because you can talk to any sitting incumbent and you can say it's good to have primary challengers. And they'll all say, yes, it's great to have primary challengers, but they'll weirdly never encourage primary challengers. Um, but primary challengers are good. Young people are tired of voting for the same people over and over and over again and not seeing their quality of life change or get better. They just need to get worse. You need to give them a candidate that they can actually care about. Look what happened with, with Bernie Sanders. He energized an entirely new voter base. He brought people back to the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party, instead of embracing this and running with it and working with it and actually keeping these people engaged, pushed back and created a false divide and said, oh, Bernie bros are the problem. That's why Hillary lost. They've created this false sense of divide in these two parties that's going to keep pushing young people out. Young people overwhelmingly supported Bernie Sanders, especially, you know, millennials and Gen Xers overwhelmingly supported Sanders because he was speaking to the issues things that matter. And we need candidates that are going to be unafraid to come out and talk about the things that matter, that are going to come out and be unafraid to take shots, to actually fire a shot across the bow about things that we care about. We care about Medicare for all, fire shots at the pharmaceutical industry, fire shots at the health insurance industry. And we do that by doing exactly what Dorothy talked about, by refusing to take corporate money from these businesses, these lobbyists, these special interest groups. When you start to tell people, no, I'm only grassroots, I'm, I only take donations from people, their eyes light up when, when you are out canvassing. They're like, oh, really? And you say, absolutely, because I don't want to represent corporations. I want to represent you. And I mean it. I'm not out, I'm, I'm putting my feet to the pavement and I'm actually committing to that message and that value system. And I think giving people that real candidate, it's not just saying, I'll definitely fight for you, I'll fight for jobs, I'll fight for access, I'll fight for X, Y, and Z words. They actually are putting their money where their mouth is quite literally and saying, I want to represent you by only taking money from you. And I think that's how you re-energize people, give them something different, give them something they're craving for, they're dying for, which is a real message and a real platform that affects real people. Another thing too, I think note is also a uh, campaign, um, voter suppression. Any Every county with more than 75% of black uh, population uh, saw their DMV closed. I'm from India, this surprises me. We have a, a polling booth in every few counties every 1.5 to 3 kilometers. That means every mile or so. Uh, one polling booth every uh, mile or so. Secondly, there is certain polling booths that are just open for one or two people. There's one person in Gujarat, he's been voting for around 50 years. That polling booth has been open for 50 years just for that person. So we need to, just looking at a voter turnout as a single thing issue um, is, I think, a mistake. What we have to look at comprehensively is what can we do to increase participation? We start everywhere. We start from education. We have to reimagine uh, how we do education, reintroduce civic education. I did not know until my husband told me that civics is not a compulsory subject here in America. It was a part of history for me. I learned how the Indian government worked. And um, we need to reimagine education. Uh, reinvest in public education. Uh, secondly, we need to um, look at gerrymandering. Third, we have to look at uh, voting after uh, restoring all rights after somebody has been uh, served their time in prison. Um, uh, because majority of putting uh, African Americans in for nonviolent offenses, then these people can't vote after that once they've already served their time. That would explain, even though uh, African American men have uh, are at par with the, uh, as a percentage of population, they had a lower voting percentage in Alabama. A lot of them are not able to vote because uh, because they have just been put in prison. There's a lot of things we can do. Federal legalization of yeah. marijuana that will suddenly open up a lot of people uh, who can suddenly vote. Um, also, engaging these communities in off election years, not just going to the black voters when we need when our ass is online when we need. Sorry if I can't say that word. Um, we we can't 
when we need them, we're going to them come vote for us. I don't think that's enough. I don't think it's fair. It's un, uh, undue burden put on those communities. And uh, when, when they do come out, because they have the right to not come out because we didn't seek their uh, vote, we did not earn their vote, then we blame them. See, the black people didn't turn out, the brown people didn't turn out there. So I think it has to be a there has to be a grassroots revolution and revolution is not the cult of the bomb and pistol. What revolution means is the current system that is based in manifest injustice must change. So come on the streets, make your voices heard, attend your local uh, meetings, uh, talk about, under, uh, try to understand the intersection of all these issues, how they come together, how they keep us divided and actively try to overcome that. We need an educated populace and now is the time we need everybody to put in the time to uh, do that. And Dorothy, you have a slightly different demographic. Um, how how do you talk to people to get them engaged? Um, well, I mean, a lot of the same things. It's getting them, giving them a reason to vote. I mean, that's the thing: is the Democrats are not giving people a reason to vote. They don't have a clear message. They don't have. They don't. They're not listening, and they're 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 perpetuating this elitism and. They're not respecting the fact that that young people have valuable opinions, like that we have ideas that can make things better and that we need that. We need fresh ideas. The leadership of this country has failed for decades and it is time to change it. It is when when leadership fails, you don't you don't, you know, promote people from within that same group of leadership. You bring in new leaders. And so it's what they do if a business fails. If a business is failing, then they fire the executives and then they don't hire people from within that company. They bring in outside executives to change things with fresh ideas in order to save the company. And that's what we need to do with this country. And the thing that the Democrats also do is they only knock on the doors of people who are identified as Democrats and had voted in the last four elections. So they're not even talking to the people who haven't, who aren't voting. And they're not talking to the people who haven't been identified as Democrats. And in Washington state, we are all non-affiliated voters. We don't register by party at all. So they're only they're only reaching people they've already reached over and over and over again. So they're not knocking on the doors of new people. And so that's like, you know, we're targeting people who are likely Democratic voters and who, and we don't care. We don't care if you've ever cast a ballot. Like, we're going to have that conversation with you because it's going to take, it's going to take an uprising. But the beauty of it is, in order to make change, we only need 3.5% of the population to be actively engaged. And that is enough to reach enough people to make change. Wow. Betsy, did we have any questions on the line? Uh, there was one for both candidates from Jilly Love 101. She wanted to know their views on Russia, AFRICOM, and Nuke Energy. Uh, I'm terribly fam familiar um, as far as Russia goes. I I think you know Russia. Obviously, there was a there have been some questions of security with Russia and everything. And as we're we're doing what we can to look into that as a government, there's not we can't do much more than what we're already doing. So I think we need to just let whoever's investigating it, whoever's working on that, just do their jobs. But people, I mean, Nina Turner said it point blank: the people don't care about Russia. They care about whether or not they can turn their lights on. They care about whether or not they are going to be dying in the streets from cancer because they don't have health care. Uh, they care about whether or not they can ever get out from underneath their student loan debt. They care about uh, whether or not net neutrality stays neutral. Uh, they care about things that affect their daily lives because we're, we're too exhausted to care about all these other security threats. We're too tired, we're, we're too indebted. We've been fighting too hard for too long. We can't care about, about things like Russia as much as we want to. I know we should, everyone knows we should, but we just can't. 
And we don't have that luxury. And I'm sorry, but it's a privileged position to, to care about Russia the way that some of our representatives are doing. Um, Adam Smith is constantly hammering away about Russia, constantly talking about Russia, almost never talking about Medicare for all, almost never talking about climate change, never talking about education, not the things that actually really affect people. So it, it is a privilege to be able to have that be your top concern because I worry whether or not my husband and I are gonna be able to pay our mortgage every month. Dorothy, did you, did you have any uh, comments on this? Uh, well, I mean, I definitely agree with the stuff on Russia. I mean, I think there's mostly um, financial collusion. This was a whole lot of just trying to get around sanctions. And I know like um, they want to be able to sell drilling equipment so they can drill in the Arctic. And that's, I think ExxonMobil makes drilling equipment that they want to be able to sell. And with the sanctions in place, they can't. <laughs> And so that's a lot of what's going on here behind the scenes. And that's nothing like, and yes, anybody who's involved in that should be arrested and put in jail, but we don't seem to jail white collar criminals. So it's probably not gonna happen. Um, and then I just Googled AFRICOMS. <laughs> the honesty is real, transparency. Yeah, and so um, I, uh, it is what I thought it was. It's a, I, I guess they're talking about our actions in Africa. Um, our ah. in Africa. And in that case, yeah, uh, we need to stop. We need yes. to completely rethink our foreign policy. It has been a failure. Um, we are engaged um, 13 countries officially um, and counting. That seems to keep going up. Um, and it's not doing us any good. It's not it's not fixing any problems. And a lot of these issues are because of generations of colonialism and oppression on Africa, on the Middle East. And what we need to be looking at is how we can help them develop sustainably for the 21st century in whatever way that looks for them. It won't necessarily look the same as what we consider, you know, development. But we should be engaged just in humanitarian ways and helping them develop and helping them develop in a sustainable way so they're not dependent on fossil fuels and allowing them to benefit from their own resources instead of robbing them of their resources because that's what all of these conflicts are about all of these conflicts are about going in and taking advantage of these people and taking their resources and their wealth away from them and we need to stop Exactly. What we do in America is what we are doing throughout the world. We are taking from the poor and giving to the rich, and we are using our massive military to do that. Yes, I am. I actually got in, I was very I got introduced as the anti-war candidate not too long ago, and I was very excited. Um, we need to straight repeal that authorized use of military force. Yep. That needs to be repealed like yep. yesterday. We need to repeal that sucker because right now it's in the hands of an incredibly unstable man, and it's taken away one of the primary powers. Congress, which is the power to debate and declare war. That's why we're involved in 13 other countries. I remember when we heard about the, the four men who were killed in Niger, Congress didn't even know. They didn't know that we were even in Niger. And that's their job. That's one of their core powers. A repeal of the authorized use of military force is one of the only ways we're going to be able to take the power back and stop the expansion of the military industrial complex. It will not happen until we take that back and we restore that power to Congress. Mm -hmm. We well, also need to repeal the rule that allows the the executive branch like 90 days of action before we even start yeah. debating it. It's That's not written into the Constitution. The Constitution clearly states that Congress has the power to declare war and peace. And the reason for that is the reason that our founding fathers put that in that document was because they did not want the executive branch to have that kind of power. Because kings had been doing that like they had been getting their people involved in these conflicts for their own personal gain to build up their own you know their own stockpiles of wealth and that's what they're doing here right they're putting our people's lives in danger and they're putting and they're harming civilians innocent people in these countries so that they can become wealthy and more wealthy, right? I mean, they're already wealthy. It's so that they can have even more wealth. They're hoarding gold in their, you know, in their treasury. And that's what they want to do. And that's harming people. So we absolutely, yeah, Congress needs to take back its power. Well, amazingly, we have now spoken for an hour. 
Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and I wish you the best luck in the upcoming election. And uh, Supreet, awesome work uh, at the ground level that you're doing. Um, is there any 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 short messages that you think anyone would like to say before we, we uh, close out? Oh, I would just like to say one more thing that we cannot let three people decide uh, the future for of internet for the rest of us. We cannot let one let one person decide where our kids go to war and then refuse them health care when they come back. Be involved now. Let's take our power back and uh, let's take control of our future. It's our future. It's time we start making decisions about it. Yeah. And uh, my short message to people is vote Sarah Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously vote Sarah Smith. Yes, I know a lot of viewers are, are definitely in Oregon as well. Um, but if the thing I say every single time, the revolution starts with us the best advocate for your progressive value system is you. So show up to your legislative districts. If they try to push you out, sure refuse, fun. stand your ground, hold on, because eventually you're gonna hit a point where you're gonna be that member. You're gonna get to cast that vote. You're gonna get to elect your chair. You can fight back. That's what we've been doing in Washington slowly. We've been trying to take over executive boards with real progressives. We've been trying to make sure we're putting progressive people in, in these positions. The best thing you could possibly do is if you don't wanna run for office or it's never been, up, never been something you're interested in, become a member in your local legislative districts. Have that power, that voting power. Your vote is your voice. I mean, Supreet mentioned, you know, it's not the it's not a fight of pistols and bombs. It's a it's a fight with votes. We can win. That's all the power. That's all of our power. So show up to your legislative districts, get involved, vote, uh, run for run for office. If you've been toying with the idea, whether it's water commissioner, city council, mayor or congressman, if you have been considering running for something, do it run for something because we need people to be bold and stand up. We, we can't wait for someone else to change the system for us. It's been proven for decades. It will not change if we don't change it for ourselves. And we can do it. We can do it together and support each other by building coalitions like these. Thank you so much. Um, so for upcoming events, uh, just a reminder, on January 6th, we have the nomination convention for Senate District uh, 19 in Portland. Uh, on January 13th, we have Supreet's Town Hall for Progressive Democracy, focusing on housing and homelessness. That is between 5 o'clock and 8 p.m. Uh, in Renton, Washington. And you can find out about that event by going to Our Revolution uh, and looking on the events uh, uh, search page. Uh, and the details of that will come up and details about registration. And then... Uh, we have the platform convention of the Democratic Party of Oregon coming up on March 17th and 18th. And look out for a, uh, um, a video that I'll be making uh, shortly, which talks about the process and what, what happens that weekend so you can mentally prepare yourself and, and get excited for the event. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, Progressive Oregon is taking a holiday break. So our next program will be Sunday, January 7th, uh, 2018. Uh, great news about additional programs. So Progressive California launches on January 7th, and then Progressive Washington also la launches in January. So next we're week, hopefully. Next week, awesome. Next week. So we're going to have a wall in the Western United States of uh, uh, Progressive live stream broadcasts. And finally, if you haven't uh, emptied your pockets of all of your spare change, uh, uh, you can always donate to Progressive Oregon at progressiveor.org. You can also help support uh, the creation of programs like this by Uphill Media. Uphill Media is a nonprofit 501c3. So if you itemize your taxes, you can deduct your contributions there. And that's at donate.uphillmedia.org. Thank you so much. Happy New Year and see you in January. And I, I'm going to break in here just to say, Dorothy, did you want to get a last few minutes? Because we can go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, just the. Uh to re kind of play on what Sarah said, it's just, yeah, get involved, get involved in whatever you can. And I know that it sucks to walk into these Democratic Party meetings, but they have so much power and influence that we cannot continue to let them control the narrative. We have to get in there. So if you are, if you have it, if you have the stomach and you can be tough and you can get in there and you can face down these bullies, please do. Please get involved. We need you. And for 
the Portland area people, we are right across the river, just across the bridge, headquartered in Vancouver. Yes, so if you're interested in helping out with this campaign and helping us swing this district, uh, you can go to our website, DorothyForCongress.com, and uh, you know, sign up to volunteer. We'll contact you and let you know what's happening. And also, um, keep a lookout on TYT's uh, Rebel Headquarters interview for... I'll be on on the 27th, and I, Sarah, I think, will be on the 28th. Yeah, I'm yeah. on the 28th. That's <laughs> yeah. So, and, and they're interviewing pretty much, I guess, all of us, all the Justice Democrats um, throughout the month. So if you want to hear from what we all have to say and really get excited and energized because these candidates are amazing. They're mm -hmm. absolutely, we're all passionate, we're all running from the heart, and we're all really working to make this a better place.